I kind of want to build on the previous presentations, and I was looking at who was speaking, I thought, oh, there's a real danger that I just repeat almost the same thing that's, that's been talked about this morning. And obviously there's a strong emphasis on design. We had MELD earlier, we had Think Place, we've had DMA. Um, so I could also tell you again about design and service design. I'm not going to do that. Uh, um, I'm going to sort of really look perhaps more towards the end game. And that's why I thought what I'd call my presentation this morning was about moving the needle. Because, you know, this has actually been quite a long journey in terms of trying to build in more innovation into the government. Um, particularly, I've come out of the gov 2 movement, which for me is almost approaching a four or five year journey of, of talking about this stuff. And in particular, my interest has always been around innovation, particularly social innovation, and how that links to Government 2.0. I think, for me, what's been interesting is that in those last four years or so, I think what we've realised is that what we've been focused on was about the risks. So, you know, um, it's always, there's been a bit of a thing about, you know, come on into the water, it's, 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 it's warm, it's safe. And obviously in government, and you've been quite concerned about the risks. We're actually getting used to that environment now. We've got ways of managing those risks. In fact, this week I was talking to a client in Sydney, a government client, who was saying that part of the value that we brought to working with them through this process was to really just almost hold their hands and show them that it wasn't as risky as they thought and they could do it. And once they got into the water and had the right processes in place, the right resources in place, it actually wasn't too bad. So in a way, what we've kind of done is tick the box. In terms of innovation around the use of social media in, in this idea of government 2.0, we've kind of done that. Not everyone is quite up to the same level as, as everyone else, but really it's just a question of when, not if. So we've, we've moved on from that old phase of Gov 2.0. So what's next? And you know, realising the theme of this, this particular um, stream is around empowerment, what I want to try and do is empower you by thinking a little bit further, a bit further than just worrying about whether there's jellyfish out there in that social media um, sort of pool of water, but actually, there's, something, there's a bigger reason that we want to be in that pool in the first place. So, and just to link it back to what we've been talking about this morning, though, this is our particular process for, for, for our design-led approach, and it's very much around discover. So all the different techniques you've heard about this morning, about going out, um, talking to people, getting people involved in the design process. We certainly follow all of that. And I think um, what's really important, though, is, that, is going through all three steps. Going out and discovering, understanding, understanding the context, working with people to design solutions, but also about doing, actually executing. Because there is always a risk, and, and I'm talking about my own experience of working with um, people in terms of um, in, in mental health, um, around social security, that we've actually had some really good ideas over the years, and we've engaged with people, and they've told us what they want, but we actually haven't got to do the do stage. And there's a real challenge, a real barrier, to actually taking all these great ideas that we have and actually doing something about it. It's really easy to sit back and go, well, you know, it takes time. Um, you know, these things take time. We've got to get used to the idea. But I'll go through a few examples and really say, actually, no, it doesn't always take time. We've actually got to change um, some of our thinking. So when I talk about empowering you, um, it's about empowering the way you think about how, what we can do, what we can achieve, and how we might need to think, um, how we might need to think differently in terms of trying to achieve those goals. So I want to stretch you, make you think just that little bit further. The first example here, um, and some of you may be familiar with this, um, that's a, a, just a bit of a screenshot of a, an intranet that's being developed by a government agency in the UK. And the government in, in, the, government in the UK have, have obviously been um, uh, impacted by austerity measures. They've also got quite a, an innovative digital um, team that is really changing how they approach uh, uh, online digital services. And there's a, there's a very deep design philosophy behind how they're doing that. One agency in the UK government, though, has taken that whole idea of, of how you engage publicly through digital channels and, and actually applied it internally. And they've set up um, a, a new, brand new intranet, it's only for 350 staff, but they've used, used WordPress. Um, the interesting thing is, though, it, it costs them, I think, £15,000 to build this intranet solution. That is just, uh, actually a, a, just a, such a small amount compared to any government project I've come across um, for building a solution like this. The other thing, though, the quote there about the 90% saving, that comes from their hosting. Now, there's a couple of things here in terms of the IT environment for government in the UK. They've kind of got a, a, this idea of a gov cloud of different services that people can use. But, you know, for me, the, the, the real thing is that this agency went out and said that we're not just going to keep doing what we've always done. 
going to a company, a massive vendor, to buy a massive system you know, that will be a solution to the problem we're trying to achieve. And we'll just keep spending large amounts of money because, hey, that's what we've always done. That's the safe approach. They've actually tried a different approach and they've ended up saving money in a number of angles. And they've also got to the end result a lot more quickly. So that's just, that's just one example of where thinking a bit differently about a particular problem, um, particularly a technology problem, where thinking differently can lead to a better, cheaper result. This other one is really exciting. Um, it's, a, it's a UK company, and I think DMA have been involved with this project. Um, so Patchwork is a, a solution that's been developed by FutureGov. And it's quite interesting because it's trying to tackle issues around um, uh, social work, community care, where you might have an individual or a family, where different agencies are involved with caring for that individual. And what Patchwork does, it really acts like a social network for um, professionals. Um, who are, might be in a um, you know, health area, the police, um, foster care, whatever it might be. And it actually lets them connect with other professionals who have an interest in a particular person. It's not a case management tool. Okay? All it does is connect across different agencies. Um, Patchwork's now coming to Australia. It's been trialled in some Victorian um, councils, and I hear rumours on the grapevine that we might see pilots elsewhere. I think this is really exciting for a number of reasons. One, is actually tackling, tackling an issue that isn't about changing something inside one agency. It's not saying, oh, you know, Department of Human Services, for example, you're just not doing a good enough job of, of managing your clients. We need to fix you. It's actually looking at the bigger picture of the problem and coming up with a solution that actually solves what the real problem is. And that, that solution was developed by engaging with the professionals who are involved and asking them what they need and what they want. I think also there's an undercurrent here of, of saying that you know, one of the, the challenges that government faces is collaboration. It's not just about how they consult the community. It's not about how they go online and deliver services to the community. It's actually how they collaborate together. But we've kind of got to be realistic. And again, thinking differently, engaging with the people involved, we can actually build solutions that tackle problems in very different ways. And I think the thing for me about in terms of empowerment and stretch targets, this is actually dealing with a real problem. This isn't just coming up with... Um, you, I mean, look, I'm really excited by GovHack and all the different things that go around that and coming up with different vis visualisations. There's definitely a, a strong angle to you know, um, culture and the arts through open data. But, you know, this is actually dealing with a problem that actually affects people. You know, real people, real problems. And we need to see more of that, OK? And, uh, and you know, there's no reason why we can't be doing more of this in this country. Um, the final... Um, uh, example here, and if you've heard me speak before, again, over the years I've talked about this on n a number of occasions. Um, this is patient opinion. This is a site where you can go and provide feedback about your experiences of healthcare. It's actually not getting a lot of coverage in this country, and I'm not quite sure why. But one of the interesting things is the screenshot there is actually of the Australian site. This site was created in the UK in 2005. So it's, about, it's taken about seven years for this innovation to get to Australia. They've pretty much picked up the code, the business model of how it's been used in the UK, and they've applied it to Australia. Um, again, and, and this is a, a more recent quote, quote, not about patient opinion specifically, but about the importance of patient engagement, is that um, one IT health specialist in the US has called it the blockbuster drug of the century. Because you know what? Health is a real one of those tricky, um, wicked problems. Yeah, we keep coming up with new drugs. We keep coming up with new ways of you know, doing surgery. But the problem is the cost keeps growing. It will just grow and grow and grow and grow. Coming up with new ways of um, treating an illness isn't necessarily the way that we are going to deal with the challenges of a growing world population, uh, challenges of an ageing population in Australia. We actually need new ways of tackling these problems. And patient opinion is one of them. I think it's really important. It needs to, get, you know, it needs to be more aware in the community about some of these ideas. So three different ideas that are trying to tackle um, real issues. One is about trying to make government more efficient in how it approaches IT. And we've heard about the complexities of managing a, a large government agency um, and how bringing new ways of thinking can help them to manage it better. So there's, there's huge scope there. The other example was trying to tackle real, you know, tricky problems in the community, again, with different ways of, of trying to solve those problems. And finally, also looking at how we can try and deal with issues in areas like healthcare by, again, not looking at improving how we deliver surgery or inventing a new drug, but actually listening to patients and understanding what they want and actually what they know about their experiences of the services they're being delivered. These are stretch goals, I think, 
for um, government in this country. We've got a handful of examples here of things that we could be doing or are doing, but there's, there's scope for so much more. Um, on that kind of sort of, um, from that, looking at it from that perspective, this is a slide I presented at Public Sphere New South Wales in 2009. Uh, and it did strike me as I was putting these slides together that if we look and we sort of tick off, um, some of the things I was saying at the time we needed to do is service, the service code design culture. I'm really excited to have so many people here today talking about design and service design. I was calling for that in 2009, and it's actually happening. That's a really big tick for me. That's really exciting. Um, the last one at the bottom there, release the data. Well, we have had just a, a weekend of GovHack. It's been one of a number of events that have been held over the years. We see some great ideas and innovation sort of come out of those, those events. Uh, and so again, we've got to say there's a big tick there. We actually are releasing the data, and the government signed off on you know, different open data conventions, Creative Commons is being used. So we are definitely ticking some boxes. But you know that middle one, social innovation with technology, i.e. solving real problems that affect this country? That's the one where there's still a gap. And we identified that back in 2009. So I think now is the time for us to, to step up and actually start to deal with that, that, last, that last goal that we need to, need to do more around. So three, three pieces of advice, I guess, if you want to um, sort of um, have something to take away from, from my experience and ideas, is that, one, we need to keep embracing these new design methods. Um, they definitely have value. They, they feel different. They may seem um, a strange way of dealing with problems, but there's such a growing body of evidence that design-led thinking um, or service design actually has real application and value. We need to embrace those design methods. That sounds simple, but it has an effect on how government does business because government likes to go out and say, I have a solution, please build that, build that for me. And that's not really a very good fit for a design-led approach. Um, secondly, we need to challenge the status quo, but not because we're trying to be innovative, a bit like um, uh, Craig Fox, I think, from the ATO. It's not about inventing new things. We want to challenge the status quo, be innovative, because actually we can show we can reduce risk and we can reduce costs by doing things differently. Okay? So it's not about being different for the sake of being different. It's because we know it's actually a better way of doing it. And finally, um, we need to invest in innovation. Um, all these events, all the gov hacks, all the different meetings, all the different ideas that have gone out there, um, there's been a lot of work by a lot of volunteers, both on the government side, people outside of government, consultants, software developers. They've all put a lot of love time, effort, sometimes money, into building ideas. I think we're, again, reaching the end of that phase being the, the engine room of innovation in government. It's been great to see the ideas. You know, it's built the proof of concept. We now need to change and actually start to invest. Um, patchwork, which was one of the examples I mentioned earlier. The UK government and um, other funding bodies invested money into that idea. That's what got it off the ground. It is, you know, it's, it's run by a private company. It's not government that created patchwork. But government, the community, had a role in backing that idea. If you look more broadly at the startup community, so the technology startup world in Australia, they do struggle for funding. And I think that's also a big issue for what we want to achieve around innovation in government. It can't just be reliant on people coming in on the weekend to build something funky for government. It's got to be a two-way street. Um, and it's worth investing. We can get real results. Thank you. Any, any questions or, or tomatoes? Do you have any ideas on how funding can be obtained? Well, look, I was, we were having this conversation actually last week with a, a state government, and they were saying, look, we, we want to be careful. We've run a, run a hack event that people don't think that there's a procurement contract at the end. And um, on the table, we all sort of turned around and said, well, why couldn't there be? Why does it, you have to have a, ha have a hack event where it's just a, a place where you have some ideas, but then everyone leaves at the end of the weekend and they put out a big tender? Um, we've got to change the way we think about um, investing in these, some of these ideas. And not all the ideas will get through, but it's a risk-reward um, approach. And as long as the, the participants on both sides understand what's involved, then it doesn't have to be um, you know, one side taking advantage of the other.